Good morning, Horizon South Bay. Good morning. God is good. And all the time. And all the time. God is good. Let's worship together this morning.
this is the flow that makes me white as snow oh no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus amen Father, you are so good. (laughs) All my life, you have been faithful, God. You have been there for us, Lord. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. We thank you, God, and we just lift you up today. And we pray um, that you would just bless our congregation's hearts, Lord. And um, we love you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. You can greet your neighbors and say hello.
coming. Here I am. Good morning again, Horizon South Bay. Welcome to our pastor's second to the last service. We're going to miss you. That's all I can say. I don't, I don't want to get into it. Let me give you an update on the Martins, okay? Um, thank you for joining us, too. If you're watching us online, we're blessed to have you with us. Just to let you know, uh, Eric and his family are doing much better. Uh, I talked to him yes, well, just about every day, every other day or so, and he's giving me updates of how they're feeling. Uh, after literally um, being surrounded by prayer, uh, they really have uh, felt much, much better, and I believe they'll be here next week, to be honest with you. So yeah, keep them in your prayers. Uh, normally, we have communion uh, every other second Sunday of the month, but we're going to save that for next week. And um, just a, a reminder, also, next Sunday, we're all going to be in here because we all want to be here um, for his last message, and so there's not going to be any Sunday school. Uh, the toddler room will be open, so if you're a, a parent and you have a toddler and you want to go in there and watch your own child, that's fine, that's great, but everybody else is going to be invited in the service just to bring that to your attention. Tonight, I can't stress this enough of how important this is to me. It's just something dear to my heart, my children, my kids, my grandkids. To, we're going to meet back here 6 to 8, and we are going to go over the California Health Youth Act, which I believe was uh, 2016 and, and when it actually um, came out and now is being enforced. Um, you're going to hear firsthand from um, people in the um, public school system administrator, a teacher, principal, and really be able to uh, elaborate on what's just being taught in our uh, public school system. Extremely educational, and it's also very, uh, it, we're, we're, we're going to give resources to you that you'll be able to use for your own kids, uh, how to um, deal with what they're being exposed to. So can't, just please come back tonight, 6 to 8. Jesus Revolution, we started a new study um, Wednesday evenings now. We're meeting at the door. It's a combined fellowship. Uh, it's Greg Laurie, six weeks. Uh, we went through the first week already, but if you haven't, you know, joined, if you haven't joined us, please come on out. And uh, it's a great kind of uh, looking back and nostalgic times when I came through that, uh, that era, in a sense. So I think you'd really enjoy it. Also, baptism coming up August 29th. It's going to be at Crown Point. Uh, let us know if you're interested. We have three people I know of that are going to be uh, baptized. It's going to be at the beach. Um, everybody's invited. I think there's a rumor that somebody's going to be cooking fish tacos. Just thought I heard that. So um, come celebrate with us. Uh, it's going to be from 4 to 9 p.m. Have a bonfire. Just hang out. All right? Let's see. Let's pray for today's message and our tithes and offerings. Lord Jesus, we thank you for... Just these, um, these years, Lord, with our pastor and um, just how you've blessed this congregation, how you've blessed our pastor, Lord, how you've blessed us with him. And Lord, now as he, he leads us in these last two um, Sundays, Lord Jesus, I pray that an outpouring of your Holy Spirit would just uh, not only come upon him, but upon each one of us in this room, Lord, that we would hear from you. We would know, God, that we met you here this morning. And so, Lord, anoint this service. Bless our tithes and offerings, Lord, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Michael. Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. I was so bummed last week to miss one of my last Sundays. I came down sick, and I thought, oh, what is this, a cold? Is this the bubonic plague, or what is it? So I went and was tested and found out it was just a cold, but it was a bummer not being with you last week, but I'm glad here to be with you this morning. Did you get a map this morning on your way in? Map with uh, with our, uh, you're, you're going to need that map just for a minute, and then uh, um, those of you at home, uh, I can't hand one, I don't know why they don't make these things where you can hand a map through that thing, but but uh, I'd encourage you, I'm hoping that you have your Bibles open, you at home, and if you'll turn to the back of your Bibles, you'll see a place where there's maps there, look for one that says Paul's missionary journey, specifically, you're looking for the area where Paul's taking his trip to Rome. And so we'll refer to that as we make our way through in our study this morning. <clears throat> in fact, I want to take you through uh, where we'll be in that map, just so you'll know when we start speaking. We started uh, last in our last study over in Jerusalem, and so we've already made our way up through Cyprus, 
and Fair Havens down by Creek and Crete, and then uh, Malta was where the shipwreck was that we talked about last week. And so that's where we'll be this morning as we pick up our study and uh, we'll make our way up uh, to Rome this morning as we finish up chapter 28 of the book of Acts. Um, we've been in Acts for 17 months. Can you believe it? We were in the book of Matthew almost three years. We were in the Old Testament 1,942 years in the Old Testament. No, I guess it was 19 years in the Old Testament. But it was such, it's been such a wonderful adventure walking through all these scriptures with you. It's just been the, the, the most wonderful time of my life. And, and so I have lots of emotions that I'll try to keep in check this week and next week as I think about to where we go from this place here. But if you'd open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 1 and then put your finger there and then Acts chapter 28, put another, another finger there and then um, um, we'll move along through our study this morning. Lord, this is, again is your word and we are so grateful for it. I pray God that you would lead us as we follow uh, the life of now Paul as we've looked at the beginnings of the church. And Lord, once again, we ask that you'd help us uh, hear the, the melody, which is the context of your word, and that we would pay attention to the context. And then also, Lord, that you give us ears to be able to hear the harmony, the application by the Spirit of God into our heart and mind, so that we know how to walk in this world, Lord. So bless uh, our time together, Lord. We don't want to just be, uh, have pe be people that just have more information when we leave today, but we want to be a bit closer to you. Uh, we want to have that sense that we've heard your voice and that we paid attention. Lord, uh, then guide our heart this week that we would walk in the things that we've learned today. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Luke was Paul's traveling com uh, companion, his great friend, and his physician. And he's taken us on this incredible journey over these last 17 months um, through the first 30 years or so of church history. After Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, Jesus spent 40 days teaching his apostles and followers the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And finally, when he came near his ascension, he told his apostles to wait in Jerusalem for the promised Holy Spirit to come and uh, that he would come and baptize them with his Holy Spirit power so that they would be effective witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the othermost parts of the earth. And you're in Acts chapter 1. I want to read just a couple of verses as we begin our study, uh, beginning in verse 9, Acts 1, verse 9. Uh, Dr. Luke recounts this. Now when he, that's Jesus, had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Jesus' ascension uh, took place on the Mount of Olives just east of Jerusalem. In fact, it's just across the Kidron Valley, and it faces the temple and faces uh, Jerusalem itself. And um, the place was a scene of many events throughout the Old Testament and then also in the New Testament. If you remember the story of Absalom trying to take his father's kingdom, David's kingdom, uh, when David was driven from his uh, palace, he crossed the Kidron Valley and went up to the, uh, the Mount of Olives and crossed that way. And, uh, uh, and we see that, that in 2 Samuel chapter 15 through 17. And then Solomon, his son, later on had a lapse of faith, and he built actually idols to Molech on the side of uh, the Mount of Olives in 1 Kings chapter 11. Ezekiel, if you remember back then, I don't know how many years ago that was, but Ezekiel, back in chapter Ezekiel chapter 11, he saw a vision of the glory of God, the throne of God, the throne of Jesus, leaving the temple, and that glory came out and hovered over the Mount of Olives before it disappeared 
and uh, and it was just an incredible vision that we looked at in that. And then the Lord gave him prophecies of the coming Babylonian captivity. Jesus visited the Mount of Olives many, many times during his earthly ministry. And every time he went to Lazarus's home or Mary and Martha's home, uh, he would have to go there because that's where they lived, was out there on the Mount of Olives. And so uh, uh, he went there uh, very often. In Matthew 21, uh, it was the story of the triumphal entry where Jesus comes into Jerusalem. And that triumphal entry begins on that same Mount of Olives. When Jesus began talking to his disciples about the destruction of the temple and, um, and the end of days, the end of times, the disciples asked him, well, when are these things going to take place and what will be the sign of your coming? And uh, they asked that question on the Mount of Olives. And Jesus there in Matthew 24 and 25 gave the Olivet Discourse regarding the coming destruction of Jerusalem, the future tribulation period, and the second coming of Christ. In Matthew 26, it was on the Mount of Olives where the Garden of Gethsemane was. And um, it was where Jesus prayed in agony, Father, if, if it's possible that you can take this cup from me. And, of course, not as I will, but thy will be done, Father. When he prayed in agony, that was there on that Mount of Olives in that, that garden there. The disciples had slept, and, and it was in that same mountain where Judas came and betrayed Jesus. And then here in Acts uh, chapter 1, Jesus ascends into heaven from this very same mountain, and the angels declared that he will come back to earth, not in the rapture, but when he comes back in the second coming, he will come back to judge and establish his kingdom in the same way that he left, in other words, up through the clouds. But clear back um, 600 years earlier, Zechariah told us that he will not only come back in the clouds the same way that he would leave, but he will come back precisely to the same Mount of Olives that he ascended from. And so when Jesus comes back in the second coming, we read in Zechariah 14, 4 and 5, and in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west. You and I are going to have a great vantage point because we're going to watch that mountain split in half. We're going to be on the Mount of Olives with him. We're going to see Jerusalem. We're going to see all that transpires as Christ comes back to claim the kingdom, to establish his, his kingdom as was promised all through the Old Testament. And so our study in the book of Acts began with Jesus' final words to his disciples and his ascension from the Mount of Olives. His apostles and followers did as he had commanded. They went into Jerusalem and they waited there. They waited up in the, up in the upper room, and uh, for 10 days they were waiting, and uh, they were not disappointed because all of a sudden there was a rushing mighty wind, tongues of fire over each one of his followers, and they began to speak in languages that they had not learned. It was the day of Pentecost, and the church began, and it was 29 to 30 A.D., and when we followed Luke's account as he presented the history of the church as we've been studying now through these 17 months of the book of Acts, we watched and we learned and we listened as Jesus' witnesses preached, suffered, many of them were martyred, they performed miracles, established congregations, faced abuses, imprisonments, traveled through many lands, faithfully telling the story of the good news of salvation through belief in Jesus Christ. The New Testament church, that is the people of the way, as they were called in those early days, began in Jerusalem. But according to Jesus' commission, it wasn't to remain there exclusively. Jesus had said, go into all the world. Persecution began in Jerusalem almost immediately. Within a year, Stephen, the evangelist, the deacon turned evangelist, was martyred for his faith, stoned as uh, a future apostle, Paul, was holding the coats of those who were stoning him for the sake of the gospel. Many of the new Christians fled Jerusalem and scattered among the surrounding nations in fear for their lives. This was the Christian diaspora or the scattering of Christians at the beginning of the church. In fact, they scattered so far and wide that as the evangelists began obeying the Great Commission, began, began going to all parts of the world, as they did that, they would run into little pockets of Christians here, little churches that had sprung up from these the people that had left Jerusalem but taken their faith with them 
And when they'd gotten to their new place, they established communities of people that were following uh, the teachings of, of, of who Christ was and as the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. <clears throat> From Acts 1 through 12, the story centered on the acts of Jesus' apostles chosen while he was on earth in human form. In chapter 13 until the end of the book, it's centered on the exploits of Paul, this converted murderer of the earliest Christians, saved on the road to Damascus by direct intervention of Jesus. We follow the, this new apostle, also chosen by Jesus, but chosen after Christ had ascended into heaven to reach the Gentiles with the same gospel. In our last study, Paul had completed his three formal missionary journeys. He had traveled to Jerusalem. He was arrested there and abused and tried by the Sanhedrin and two governors and a king. We studied how Paul insisted, because he was a Roman citizen by birth, to stand before Nero because any other thing that they would send, they, their idea was to send him back to Jerusalem with the Sanhedrin try him, but it had been revealed that the Jews were going to kill him along the way. And so he had insisted that he would exercise his right as a Roman citizen to stand before Nero. No one had been able to convict him because he was innocent of all of the charges that had been brought against him. But he still was not let free. And they kept him in prison for free uh, uh, because of political reasons. And so we sailed with Paul last week through dangerous waters and inclement weather and a shipwreck under the centurion Julius who had protected Paul during the adventures that they had at sea, including the great storm which ruined their boat. When the storm uh, crushed their boat, when it was pushed onto a sandbar in the middle of the sea, uh, God had promised that all of them would be saved even though they'd been disobedient. God promised that they would be saved and all 126 by God's grace, were saved and be able, were able to swim ashore. And they found that they were on, the, on Malta, some 60 miles south of Sicily. And so this is where we are this morning as we pick up our story, um, as Paul comes closer to his day in court with Nero in Rome. And so we begin at Acts 28, verse 1. This is where our study begins. It's 59 to 60 A.D. It's 30 years after the day of Pentecost. Now, when they had escaped, that is, from the shipwreck, then they found out that the island was called Malta. And the natives, the word natives there is the Greek word uh, barbaros, which we, where we get uh, barbarians from. Uh, however, we find out that they're not barbarians at all. They seem to be pretty wonderful people in that place as they'll take care of Paul and all of those that uh, got to shore safely. But the Greeks and the Romans spoke of anyone who didn't speak Greek as barbarians, and these did not speak Greek, and so they were barbarians to them. Um, and the natives showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain, and uh, the rain that was falling and because of the cold. Notice as we read uh, that verse 2 that Luke uses the word us, and he uses it over and over. He's telling us that he was there with Paul. He's not reporting on something that happened to Paul. Luke was traveling with Paul to be his comforter, his faithful companion, and his physician. So he's experienced all, all of this. So he's an eyewitness to these events. Malta is a rocky island about 17 miles long and 9 miles wide. And as I said, about 60 miles south of Sicily, uh, today in southern Italy. In the Mediterranean Sea, Malta was under Roman rule and overseen by an official named Publius, and we'll see that in verse 7. By the way, Malta still exists. It's interesting that this little place of Malta, uh, this island of Malta, uh, it has on the eastern side of that island, it has a place, uh, has a bay there that is called the Bay of Paul, or St. Paul's Bay, a testimony to the true events that took place in Acts chapter 28 that we're reading about. The most significant thing about the island of Malta is that the residents there had never heard the gospel. They appear to have been decent and caring people, but they were lost in their sins, yet they were loved by God. In fact, God loved them so much that he sent his only begotten son 
that they might be redeemed from their sins and have everlasting life. And furthermore, God would take the hardships and tragedies of Paul's life, his arrest on phony charges, his unfair and illegal trials, his imprisonment, a terrible two-week storm at sea and a shipwreck, and even a snake bite to reveal his love to them. And they had no idea what was coming. God begins by washing his premier evangelists up onto their shore. When the Maltese people, originally they came from Phoenicia, by the way, about 500 B.C., but when the Maltese people saw this rain-soaked, bedraggled band of 126 survivors flailing their way through the cold waters of the Mediterranean toward the shoreline, they saw desperate people needing to be saved and cared for, and so they acted in kindness, building a fire and welcoming them. What they didn't realize was they thought they were saving people as they were coming onto their shore. What was really happening was God had sent salvation to Malta. This Paul, this prisoner, was sent by God because of his love for those people so that they might find everlasting life. Before we leave this scene, I'd like to preach an important sermon on just, in just a few words. When I read through Paul's life, I see a life after his conversion full of difficulties and hardships, abuses, false charges, imprisonments, and conspiracies against him. But Paul never succumbed to self-pity, not once. We hear of him tell of the ordeals that he went through, but he was never overcome by self-pity. He was so overwhelmed by the salvation that he had received by God's grace and mercy that he used every single difficulty and circumstance that came his way as an opportunity to enter into Christ's sufferings and to grow in faith and to grow in patient endurance and to grow in dependence on God so that he could comfort the afflicted and powerfully testify to the truth of the gospel. Self-pity betrays faith. Trust advances it. Can I say that again? Self-pity betrays faith. Trust, excuse me, advertises it. That's what I meant to say. Trust advertises it. When we're tempted to wallow in our hardships and self-pity, we should remember Paul and by faith seize the opportunity to advertise God's faithfulness by trusting in him. Now, folks, I've known you for quite a long time, most of you, one way or another, and I've watched you go through difficulties of all sorts. Some of you are in difficulties right now. I've watched your lives in, in all of those situations. I don't remember ever seeing any of you be so overcome by those difficulties that you just wallowed in self-pity. Your testimony to me and all the difficulties I've watched you go through is your faith in Christ. You have advertised that God is faithful in every situation. And that has been a great blessing to me and an encouragement to many who are weaker in the faith. This is what Paul did. He used every opportunity not to wallow in self-pity, but to trust God and advertise his goodness. Because, you see, what may be happening when we're going through our difficulties God may be washing us up on someone else's shore to bring comfort to them and also perhaps even to say a word that will lead to everlasting life. Verse 3, But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came and be, that came out because of the heat and fastened onto his hand. Note, first of all, that the Lord's most eminent ambassador wasn't too important to gather sticks. Jesus, we are told, came, to be came not to be ministered to, but to minister. Paul was a follower of Christ. If there was a need for sticks, Paul would be the one out gathering them, though he was, like I said, the most eminent of all of the evangelists of the New Testament era. But one stick that he gathered wasn't a stick. It was a well-known poisonous viper, and it fastened itself to Paul's hand. We have snakes out in Upper Deerhorn Valley. I've got a chance to wrestle with one so far. Uh, I won that battle. Uh, but, you know, snakes don't have arms and hands. Did you know that? And so if they're going to fasten themselves to you, what are they going to use? They're going to use their fangs, aren't they? 
And so this is what happened to Paul. He's gathering sticks, and he picks one up, and it's a viper, not a stick, and it fastened to his hand. And in the fastening of that to his hand, the venom from that snake went into Paul. So um, when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. But he, that is Paul, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they looked at him for a long time and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Several things capture my attention as I read through this account of Paul's snake bite. First, not only were the indigenous Maltese people kind and compassionate to the survivors of this shipwreck needing help, but they were people who had a moral code regarding right and wrong and consequence for evil. And, uh, evil deeds bore co consequences and they had an idea of what justice was. Makes me wonder if it's not true what uh, Romans 2.11 told us, as Jim uh, taught that to us, that perhaps God had given a general revelation even to these people that did not know him about right and wrong and consequence for evil. Certainly they weren't believers in the God Jehovah. It's likely that their pagan deities were from the Grecian culture because of their proximity. Justice, in verse 4, where it says uh, uh, there it speaks about uh, justice was coming after uh, this uh, uh, supposedly murdering person. Uh, justice, in verse 4, is personified as a being. And it's referring to the uh, probably to the goddess Dike, which was someone that they believed was the goddess over justice. Obviously, because of this man's evil deeds, murder, they assumed, the goddess DK was making sure he didn't get away with his evil. She's killing him. That's what they thought. Paul shook off the viper into the fire. He was confident that he was not going to die because God had promised him he's going to Rome and he's going to be able to speak before the authorities in Rome. And so for Paul, this viper has, nothing, has no power over him. And so that promise was given to him in Acts 23.11. Paul continued to tend to the fire as the people waited for him to fall over and die. The people kept watching, but Paul kept tending. After a while, long enough for a person to die, they began to believe that Paul was a god. It was a logical explanation for such a miracle. Luke gives us uh, no uh, open response uh, from the people or from Paul, perhaps these were thoughts that were never shared openly, but known by the Holy Spirit revealed to Luke. I don't know. Paul was also mistaken, um, mistakenly seen by the people of Lystra in Acts 14 as the Greek god Zeus. There he corrected the people forcefully, and perhaps he did here also, but it's just not recorded uh, as that, uh, that that happened. If the Maltese people were still entertaining the thought that Paul was a god, verses 7 through 11, would have added fuel to that belief, verse 7. In that region, there was an estate of a, the leading citizen of the island. By the way, that phrase, the leading citizen of an island, is actually a technical political term for the person that is the governor. This, this man is the governor of this island, whose name was Publius, who received us, Paul, uh, Luke telling us that he was here also, and entertained us courteously for three days. <clears throat> and it happened, verse 8 says, that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went into him and prayed, and he laid hands on him and healed him. Now, these, these are some things that we don't know about this time spent at Governor Publius's house. Who all stayed there? Some of the commentaries that I studied through, said that all 276 of those who had, were saved off the ship stayed there. Well, if that's true, this was quite a house that he had. Dale, do you remember that lighthouse that we went and had a party at at Waianae? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Diamond Head, yeah. Yeah, and uh, what a blessing that was at the end of that great festival. And then we got to have this incredible luau at this place. You just felt like you were in a dream, uh, this nighttime luau. And, 
this place, but it would, it would host hundreds of people, and hundreds of people were there. Perhaps it was all of those people that came off of that boat that were able to stay at Publius's, Publius's house for three days. I don't know. Perhaps it was just the centurion, Julius, Paul, Luke, and Aristarchus. I don't know. Nevertheless, God provided a season of refreshment for at least uh, his servants. Even, uh, and, and God does that in unusual times and in unusual places. Sometimes in our worst times, he'll establish this rock that sticks up above the turmoil of life and he'll set us on it for a little while and so that we're able to catch our breath again and, and be nourished with the, the sense of his care for us. And that seems to have what happened here in the midst of these difficult days. Uh, Paul and Luke and, and uh, Aristarchus and that band are uh, given a time of rest. Um, and then during that time, God would bring the, gos the gospel and uh, the power of the gospel to the people, verse 9. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. For three months, Paul will stay on uh, this, uh, uh, this island or, uh, in, uh, in, in, on Malta, and the people, having seen what happened at Publius's house of the, of the father of Publius, all of a sudden get wind of it and everybody's bringing everybody. I don't know if it was at Publius' house or not, but for three months it appears that Dr. Luke and Paul are ministering the graces of medicine, but also healing people left and right, which gave them an opportunity to share the gospel with the people. In fact, they made such good friends in that situation that um, they established very, very close ties with the people. Verse 11, or 10 says, they also honored us in many ways, and when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary, like a church would do, like our church has done so many times with people that have passed through and gone on to other places and fields, and we gather things for their benefit to bless them and help them in their way. So was there a church established during this time on Malta? I don't know, because scriptures don't say Tradition says that Publius became a Christian along with many others during Paul's stay and that Publius also became the leader of the church there. One day we'll know for sure, but certainly God visited the Maltese people with miracles and the blessings of the gospel. And again, it's interesting that after this, the, the Bay of Paul appears and it goes down clear to the 20th century where we are today because it's still called that to this very day. Verse 11. After three months, we sailed in an Alexandrian ship whose figurehead was the twin brothers which had wintered at the island. And landing at Syracuse, that would be the capital of Sicily, we stayed three days. Interesting when I think about this, 126 men who had survived that ordeal of the shipwreck in Malta by the hand of the living God, they knew it was because Paul told them that it was the living God that was going to protect them. Now, after three months, they aboard a, a Roman grain merchant ship heading towards Syracuse, 80 miles to the north, and the gods that are going to be protecting them are th these twin brothers up on the, uh, um, the figurehead on the front of the ship on this Alexandrian ship. The, and these twin brothers were the likeness of the mythological sons of Jupiter and Lydia, one of his wives. Their names were Castor and Pollux, and they, in the Roman uh, uh, era, um, culture, became uh, the Gemini twins of the Zodiac. These twin brothers were considered to be patron saints and protectors of the mariners. And I wondered what these 126 guys got on the ship and they saw those gods on the front of it, if that registered to them, oh, we're protected by phony gods. We were protected by the real God, and now we're getting on a ship uh, that uh, is supposed to protect us with phony gods. Um, so they go off and they stop first in Syracuse. From there, we circled round and reached um, Regium. Regium, actually it's called. And after one day... The south wind blew, and the next day we came to Puteoli. Puteoli was a town of about 100,000 people. It was the closest major port to Rome, and it was about 150 miles away. But it was the closest uh, 
serviceable for it to roam. And so that's where all of the grain vessels would go and dump their cargo. Verse 14, when we were, uh, where we found brethren and were invited to stay with him seven days, so we went toward Rome. Can you imagine? Paul's out on this and he's gone through the shipwreck and all this business and all of a sudden he comes here and there's a church of guys and gals that come out to greet him. And he was so encouraged by the, the blessing of the church, part of that uh, grouping of people likely that had escaped from Jerusalem during the persecution. Paul's entourage will travel on foot up the Appian Way to Rome, but along this way, Paul will be encouraged by unexpected Christian brothers and sisters wishing him well. Another group we'll see that he encounters was from the port city of Puteoli, and they invited Paul to stay with him for seven days, and that was a great blessing to us, or to them. For us, it's always a joy and a blessing to find unexpectedly a Christian man or woman or family when we're traveling. I, I told you a few weeks back that when we would go to Yosemite every year for two weeks, one of the things we did, we'd set up our encampment and we'd put blankets all around, hang them on ropes all around our tent. That was when you used to be able to camp there. I, I don't know that you can do that anymore. Back in the days of the firefall, anybody know what that is? Uh, and uh, But one of the things we'd do at night, we'd pop corn, but then we'd sit around the campfire and we'd start singing hymns. And pretty soon you'd see the curtains open up as another family from somebody nearby, and we were singing softly so we wouldn't irritate people. But they would poke their heads and, can we come in and sing with you? And they would sit down, and then more people would sit down, and more people would sit down. Pretty soon we had like a congregation of people there fighting in the middle of Yosemite, a group of Christians. What a blessing it is to run into the people of God in places that are unexpected. What a great, great blessing. That's what happened to Paul. I think God sent them to encourage him, verse 15. And from there, when the brethren heard about us, that's uh, these are the brethren from Rome, heard about us, and these aren't uh, just Jewish brethren, although they were probably Jewish Christians, they came to meet us as far as uh, Appi, Forum, and Three Inns where Paul saw them, and he thanked God to courage. If, courage. if you look at your map there, you can come, come up there where you saw Puteoli, you saw Malta down there, and Syracuse, and Regium, and then you're coming up in Puteoli, and you're coming up, and you can see it call, it's called three taverns in some translation. Uh, in ours, it's called three inns. And then the Forum of a- Apollos, uh, we see uh, that there also. And so these people have walked from Rome so around 40, 50 miles, they've walked from Rome specifically to come down and encourage Paul on his way. They heard he was coming, and they, uh, and they were coming to encourage him. Paul hadn't yet been to Rome to evangelize, yet there was this thriving Jewish Christian community up there in Rome. Paul had written his letter to the Roman church, which Jim taught through um, over the last 45 years, um, uh, the book of Romans. That was the letter that Paul had written two years earlier than this. And, um, and, uh, and so they felt like they knew him. They'd heard his heart through the teachings, the doctrines that were available in the book of Romans. And so they were so anxious to meet him. And so they walked 50 miles to come down to greet him. There was two separate groups that walked uh, down, one from about 50 miles, another from about 43 miles. And they greeted him like they would greet a returning emperor after a battle because that's how they saw him, someone who was a soldier of the faith. And Paul, though exhausted, was greatly encouraged by their greeting, greetings. And he was ebullient with the joy of meeting people he didn't expect. Unfortunately, a few years later, during the sec- his second imprisonment, no one stood with Paul in Rome. He wrote that to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4. He said, I'm left here alone to face the end of my physical life, and there's no one with me. Uh, he was still a prisoner in chains, verse 16. Now, when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with a soldier who, who guarded him. Certainly, Paul was blessed by being able to live in a rented house. That was what he had rented himself, but he was privileged to be to live in a rented house for two months. And he was chained to a Roman uh, guard, uh, 
by the wrist, very loosely by the wrist, so he was still in chains. Um, and that guard was changed every four hours. So for four hours every day, he got a new person to convert to Christianity. And uh, later on, we find out that the Nero's house, the, the Roman legions, there were many Christians among them. Where'd they come from? I think they came because they had to go listen to the evangelistic message of Paul in this house. And Paul was able to talk with them. And he was able to have visitors come and go and... Um, and um, enjoy not only their friendship and fellowship, but to study and teach and um, as, as he was there. Um, and they brought comfort foods and supplies. Still, he was yet in chains, verse 17. And it came to pass after three days that Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. Now, this is not the Christians. This is the leaders of the Jews, so the Jewish faith, the people like the Sanhedrin, the, those kinds of leaders. So when they had come together, he said to them, Men and brethren, though I, have not, though I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our father, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they examined me, wanted to let me go, because there was no cause for putting me to death. But the Jews spoke against it, and I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had anything of which to accuse my nation." Of course, we studied through all those Ill illegitimate trials over the last few weeks. Um, Paul is telling the Jewish authorities here in Rome that he has no ill against the Jewish people. He loves the Jewish people. He is a Jew, a Roman by citizenship, but he is a, a Jew. And, and um, so he has no ill against them, but he's letting them know the reason why he's there. It, was, it wasn't because he necessarily, well, he did want to come to Rome, but not in this particular way. Uh, but it was because the Jews brought charges up, uh, up against him that were not founded, and he was forced to, to choose to come to, to have an audience before Nero. Remember that the Jews could try someone who broke one of their laws and even convict and sub uh, subject them to punishment, but they had lost the power of capital punishment when they became subjects of Rome. And so around 4 uh, A.D., um, they, they lost this ability to be able to um, exact capital punishment for capital crimes. They wanted Paul dead because he taught that Jesus was the long-awaited for Messiah who they crucified. But they didn't have the authority to kill him. They needed Rome's complicity in this uh, to have Paul killed. just want to remind you that it was back in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, that Jacob, who's dying on his deathbed, gives a prophecy 1,900 years earlier than this. And this was the prophecy. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver between his feet until Shiloh comes. Now the scepter was the symbol of the power of the government, the ultimate power, the power to exact capital punishment. They wouldn't lose that power until Shiloh or the Messiah had come. That was the promise that Jacob made on his deathbed. When the Romans removed the scepter from the Jews and made them subjects, many Jews put on sackcloth and ashes and went wailing through the streets of Jerusalem, declaring that the promises of God had failed because the scepter was now gone from their country and Messiah, Shiloh, hadn't come. And again, this happened about 4 AD. Yet Shiloh had come. The boy Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem, was being raised by his earthly parents up in Nazareth. In just a few years, he would make his first appearance at the temple at 12 years old, and he said he was being about his followers', followers business. And so Shiloh had come. They just didn't realize it. And when he came to them personally, they didn't receive him as Shiloh, as the Messiah. So Paul explains why he's in Rome. The Jews wanted me dead, and they couldn't legally execute me because they didn't have the authority. Verse 20, For this reason, therefore, I have called for you to see you and speak with you, because for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. Hope of Israel, what's he talking about? The hope of Israel was the blessed time of the coming Messiah who would set things right especially establishing his kingdom upon the earth. 
That was the hope of all of Israel. That's what they longed for. That's what the Old Testament prophets had taught. That's Paul longed for that time as well. He didn't live in a day when Christ was the king, a physical king over uh, Rome and all of them. They all longed for that. Paul said, because I believe the message that was given in the Old Testament, that's why I'm in change. And they said to him, verse um, Verse 21, they said to him, We ne neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren who came, who came reported or spoken any evil of you. But we desire to hear from you what you think, for concerning this sect, meaning the people of the way, the Christians, we know that it is spoken everywhere against. Uh, you know, it, it appears that when Paul went to Nero, that the Sanhedrin and all the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem lost interest. They had already, uh, be, before Festus and Felix and also uh, the king, uh, they, uh, Paul was not convicted. There was not enough to convict him. And so they had to go along with this thing. Oh, I guess he's going to Nero. But it, looks, it appears that he, they never forwarded any papers or any parts of his uh, trial information there. They didn't come and show up at the trial that he would stand before Nero. So it was as though they didn't want to be embarrassed by losing another thing, especially in front of the emperor. Verse 22, but we desire to hear from you what you think concerning this sect. What they had heard about the people of the way was that they were heretical people, an offshoot of the Jewish faith who uh, did not believe in God nor the law or uh, did not revere Moses. And they wanted to hear from Paul because he knew something about this. And so they said, we want to come and hear from you. Verse 23. So when they had appointed him a day, they came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning in, until evening. I, would you give anything to been in those conversations? I, I wouldn't particularly want to be in chains doing it, but I'd love to have been here, Paul, explain to them ab about how the Messiah fulfilled from the very beginning all of the prophecies that they longed to have come true. What wonderful conversations we have heard if we'd have been part of those. Paul and the Jewish leaders and rabbis, the Jews believed the prophecies of the coming Messiah who would come and set up the kingdom of God on earth. They truly believed that. It was what they longed for again. The Old Testament was full of those promises, and they were their hope, the hope for every believing Jew to be delivered from the Romans. But the prophets also spoke about the Messiah as a suffering servant who would be despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. He was to be beaten, reviled, spit on, smitten with the reeds or sticks, so physically ab abused that he would be unrecognizable as a human being, these prophecies the rabbis couldn't understand. What is this about? We want this strong Messiah to come and take us away from the Roman conquerors. But what is all of this? And so they spiritualized those prophecies away as if they were not things that were going to actually become true of the Messiah. Paul took them through both sets of promises and showed how Jesus fulfilled them all. He was and is the Messiah crucified and resurrected and will come again to receive all who believe on him and then set up his government upon the earth. But Christ's kingdom was and is being set up then and now. It's a, it's a kingdom of the heart in this time. The Jews could not accept that. They didn't want a kingdom of a heart. They wanted a physical kingdom where they could be the boss of the whole world. Verse 24, And some were persuaded by the things which were spoken, in some disbelieve. In my mind, disbelieving and disbelieving is here, um, along with many other scriptures throughout the Old New Testament, is a reflection of a heart's will to believe or not. Both choices evoke consequence. One to eternal life, as in John 3.16, for as many as believe. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe upon him would not perish, but have everlasting life. The other to eternal death is written about in John 3, 18. Uh, disbelief brings death, and so there's a choice to be made, a choice by the hearer. 
one way or the other, will I believe or will I not believe, which is determinative. The Bible, I believe, teaches whosoever will may come, and whosoever won't, won't. But each is held accountable for those decisions. Verse 25. And when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers. He's quoting here Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And, and so he quotes it by uh, word. Verse 26 saying, Go to this people and say, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand. And seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts and so turn. So that I should heal them. To choose against believing who Jesus is and what he has done is to choose spiritual deafness resulting in ignorance of the truth. I don't want to hear it. I don't believe in Jesus. I want to hear that garbage. And so as to choose ignorance. The truth is out there. It can be heard. Even today it can be heard, even more than it could back in that day. It can be heard on radio and television and Internet and Twitter and who knows all those other godless places. But uh, uh, it can be heard everywhere. The, uh, and uh, But to choose not to believe in Christ is to cut off the message that is true. And so to choose not to believe is to choose spiritual deafness resulting in ignorance. It's to choose spiritual blindness. It's to say, I will not look at the information. I will not see the proofs of what it is. I will not see the lives changed by this power of the gospel that you speak about. I will not see it. And so I choose blindness instead of sight. It's to choose an unhealable, uh, sinful heart. It's to choose against salvation. And when I choose against Jesus, I choose for myself not to believe and to not inherit, not to inherit everlasting life. Verse 28, therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. Now, that's just, again, this hard pill. This isn't the first time that Paul has said this. It's the thing that uh, caused several of the cities to throw him out of their community when he said, okay, you're not going to pay attention. You're not going to listen. I'm going to the Gentiles. And they blew up. And uh, Paul was stoned one time and other times uh, just badly abused. The rejection of the gospel of Christ eliminated them from salvation, but it didn't void salvation. Sometimes people who are so opposed to Christ think by my refusing it that somehow I, have, I void what has been said by the God of heaven and earth. It didn't void. It doesn't void it. God speaks. His words are honest and true, and they will happen as they said. And But... Uh, it doesn't void salvation. God would just simply take it to others who wouldn't choose spiritual deafness and blindness. Those who by choice would receive and believe who Jesus was and what he did, uh, those would be the ones that would uh, find everlasting life. And God would take it now since the Jews are rejecting him to the Gentiles. Of course, each Gentile would also have to decide for himself or hurt herself, and some did and some didn't, and some do and some don't, even in our day. But this, even this opportunity extended to the Gentiles, it became a stumbling block to them, and a great dispute broke out among them. Verse 30, Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ, with all confidence, no one forbidding him. Paul was chained and confined, yet safer and freer, freer to evangelize than ever. Some Jews entered into the kingdom. Some Gentiles, even Romans, also believe and entered into the kingdom. For two years, Paul did what he most wanted to do, which was to set before each hearer the claims of Christ to everlasting life. 
During this time, Paul, so, Paul would also write his prison epistles, Ephesians, Philemon, Philippians, Colossians. And Acts ends abruptly. Yet tradition and his letters help us understand what took place from that time. It's been said that Luke be, stopped his, his writing of Acts at this point because really he was writing it as information so that Nero would know the background of the case that was coming up against Paul. And so he stopped it there. And, and so that's why the rest of the, what happened after that is not included. I don't know for sure. Paul stood up before Nero's court and was acquitted of all charges and no doubt had his opportunity to present the gospel to Nero, who by this time was starting to lose his mind. Paul was freed for four to five years to continue evangelizing perhaps as far as Spain, and then he was rearrested and martyred by beheading along the Appian Way around 67 AD. This was not the beginning of the end, this was the end of the beginning of the church. This is our history. This is the legacy left to us so that we would know how the God we serve and the church that we're a part of came to be and how established and how it went from Jerusalem around the world. It went in a miraculous way, God leading it. And the story is continuing in much the same manner for over 2,000 years. And we see some of these stories that we see happen to Paul are still happening today around the world by martyrs who are faithful to the call that God has put upon their life. And it's the most important things in their life. And they're willing to sacrifice everything for the sake of the gospel, their comfort, their safety, their very lives. Because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And so they're willing to to sell it all, to give it all for the continuance of uh, serving Christ. Christ will one day come again to receive those who have believed upon his name. And the things that we have heard and the things that we have seen and the things that we have sensed will all come rushing in upon us as we see the kingdom of God established upon this earth and we'll have the blessing to do it. But first of all, I want to go to heaven for a little while before that happens. And then I want to come back to the Mount of Olives with Jesus and watch it split apart. And I watch, want to watch him set up his kingdom on this earth. Choice. What has your choice been? The choice comes to every man to make. Will I believe or will I choose to stay in darkness? Will I choose not to hear? Will I choose not to see? Will I choose not to believe? And the choice of that has consequence. Everlasting death. But the choice of believing is to choose life, life everlasting, life without end. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Have you made your choice? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the blessing of this incredibly wonderful book. When you open up the pages of Acts, it's only a few pages long. We spent 17 months in it. And if we started again tomorrow to study it all over again, we could spend another 17 months in it because it's the living Word of God. We thank you, Lord, for all of the studies that we've had from the very beginning of this church to this point for the privilege that we've had. I thank you for the privilege of studying it and being able to, to uh, do the best that I can to teach it but also for the privilege of knowing these people who I love so much. Thank you, Lord. For 23 years, for the most wonderful time of my life. Lord, if there's someone in here that is hovering between belief and unbelief, Jesus, I pray that uh, as we've gone through even the melody of this story, that you've had the freedom to, to sing the harmony beneath it by your Holy Spirit and to convince, as Paul tried to do, but you convince by your power that the salvation is still available and it's available for them. And Lord, I pray that you'd call them by their name and they would hear your voice and follow you and that today would be the day of salvation for them. We bless your holy name this morning. 
We pray it in Jesus' name. What can wash away my sin? wonderful week. God bless you all. Oh, and there's Jim and Julie over there for prayer if you need prayer.